welcome back thank you thank you very much for joining again so i still i think today we will continue our discussion on spirituality and social justice with a more specific focus on the indian context with respect to the caste system will that be okay okay so we may take the same template as we did last time basically you no know, we discussed last time what is right about social justice where it goes wrong and how spiritual wisdom can complement it so today let's discuss about you know what was the original intent behind the caste system and how that was beneficial what went wrong with it and how it is wrong today and how it can be uh, what how it can be set right or how spiritual wisdom can help to set things right as they exist today can i be allowed to be a lawyer advocate and a spokesperson for uh, those anti party elements whom i have kind of faced in colleges institutions oh certainly okay so a very simple question according to your learned estimate when was the last time that you can say with little amount of certainty that the perfect varnashram system was actually being practiced in the subcontinent of india well two things are there over here when we talk about perfect see nothing is perfect as soon as you apply it even if you consider the field of medicine as soon as the human element comes in people commit mistakes so even the best of doctors commit mistakes so if we look for a perfect application of something it's usually only in, in theory but in practice i would like to draw attention to three facts first is that the indian civilization indian culture whatever you want to call it has had incredible resilience so practically none of the other civilizations are still existing ancient civilizations like greek mesopotamian sumerian mayan chinese is still existing but modern china has very little in similarity in cultural continuity with ancient china all right so the point i'm making through this is that that although india was subjected to so many invasions and there were so many ways in which uh, <clears throat> the social structure could have been disrupted and people had alternatives so if the caste system were had been as discriminatory as is often pointed out as, as is often alleged then people could have left and although people did leave but that number was uh, that number is still not as big as it could have been so the so the caste system even as it existed you even if it had been even if it was problematic for many many centuries it still also gave a sense of connectedness and belonging to a unit bigger than one's family you know i would like to quote some thinkers over here these are not necessarily indian or vedic thinkers so there is a three the three major quotes so sir sydney low in his book a vision of india there is no doubt that the caste is the main cause of the fundamental stability and contentment by which indian society has been braced for centuries against the shock of politics and the cataclysms of nature it provides every man with his place his career his occupations his circle of friends it makes him at the outset a member of a corporate body it protects him through life from the canker of social jealousy and unfulfilled aspirations it ensures him companionship and a sense of continuity with others in like case with himself the caste organization is to the hindu his club his trade union his benefit society his philanthropic society so this is all almost a <laughs> what what uh, what decade this uh, quote could be cited with uh, sydney law is decade. from about uh, he's about 
is in, in endology small endology it's about 50 to 100 years ago 50 years ago roughly okay so i have two other quotes which i can there's mark tully is a cont contemporary thinker also mark tully was a music correspondent so the alienation of many young people in the West and the loneliness of the old show the suffering that egalitarianism inflicts on those who do not win. The superficiality of an egalitarianism, which in effect means equal opportunities for all to win and then ignores the inevitable losers. For all that, the elite of India have become so spellbound by egalitarianism that they are unable to see any good in the only institution which does provide a sense of identity and dignity to those who are robbed from birth of the opportunity to compete on an equal footing. That opportunity is caste. So Mark Tully was a BBC correspondent for India. And Gerald Hurd is also, Gerald Hurd is also from an Indian Indologist. In his book, Man, the Master, he calls Varanashram as organic democracy. The rule of the people who have organized themselves in a living and not a mechanical relationship. Where instead of all men being said to be equal, which is a lie. All, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all men are known to be of equal value. Could we but find the position in which their potential contribution could be released and their essential growth so pursued? So I have worked on preparing quite a, you could say, elaborate, elaborate, apologetic defense of the uh, Indian tradition and the, and the caste system. These are three quotes from it. And <clears throat> I would like to discuss each of these more, unless, of course, you would like to respond to any of these first, then we can go further. No, so just for the benefit of my, uh, I mean, my own and the viewers, uh, what what era under which king, which particular dynasty do you think that uh, I'll take out the word perfectly, but reasonably good working model of Varnashram was seen? One of the things about the Indian history was that. The villages were self-sufficient and that's why to a large extent who was ruling didn't matter that much okay. that uh, there was basically the the villages were the sources of prosperity the, the wealth was generated in the villages india is primarily an agricultural land now the cities were the centers of prosperity so the sources and centers are two different things and whenever the invaders would come, they would usually plunder the cities and the rulership of the cities would change. But because India was such a big country and whoever would come and rule, they knew that they wouldn't be able to restructure the management of an entire country or even if they were ruling one patch of the country. Still, so they didn't significantly alter the socio socio economic structure in terms of the organization in the rural society. So, so would we say that the British when they came here and started establishing their colony, their in, empire, did they find uh, the caste system reasonably in working order? Well, there have been definitely discrepancies, uh, I would say not discrepancies, there have, been, uh, there have also been atrocities which were done. Uh, but uh, there are something which is systemic and there is something which is incidental. But for example, there is a, a well-documented evidence that the Nasati, especially when it was done forcibly, was reprehensible. But even from the time of the Mahabharat, we see Sati was not a forcible practice. And to some extent, when the British opposed it, made it a law to ban it, that's when some people try to do it more because they said it's our own cultural practice. How dare you interfere with it? So similarly, with respect to the caste system, although Buddhism and Jainism offered people, in the, offered Indians alternatives to get out of the lower caste status and some people left. Subsequently, Islam came and Islam 
use the power of the sword as well as uh, the opportunity that you could get out of the caste system some people left but many did not so yes yeah, till the when the british came <clears throat> there's another quote i have i, I could find it out macaulay or macaulay said that i have traveled across the length and breadth of india and i have not seen a single beggar and not a single beggar across the country and then he said these are the these are the people who are so uh, they are, the only way we can rule them is if we can voluntarily convince them of our superiority political power is not going to work and that's why he tried to uh, anglicize the indian mind he said that we should have a educational system uh, which will educate the indian so that they start seeing what we our way of living as admirable and they start looking at their own social system as lower so now all this is not to at all to say that there hasn't been discrimination there has been terrible discrimination but the point we're making is it's a matter of scale and perspective that while there was division like these three quotes which i said that uh, which i read out basically there were benefits to the social to the division of society and, and the evils that were there they were not as much as have been portrayed the discrimination and exploitation are simply facts of human nature and if we want to compare that way look at what the european colonialists did to did to the native americans in america in north america as well as to the mayans the aztecs and others in south america Now those the native americans they are probably millions and millions and they are now a few thousands so they were put in reservation colony reserved colonies and then eventually many of them were just eliminated and 2000 year old civilization like the mayan civilization was destroyed even without weapons of mass destruction within a few decades by the by the spanish uh, conquerors so as compared to that india the lower caste no matter how much they were discriminated against still they survived and not only they survived they have uh, they have expanded they are still in there in a significant number so all that i'm saying is we need to see things in perspective in perspective there was exploitation there was terrible exploitation uh, but if you consider the very fact that wherever power has been acquired there has been exploitation the exploitation is not as bad as it is portrayed it is as if sometimes the caste system is portrayed as this caste system represents the utter evil of the indian traditional system because of which nothing from the indian tradition should even be considered yeah you gave me two solid points one is that you answered my question and you actually took my question to a little bit of a higher level that uh, my question also is rooted in the soil of uh, western way of uh, looking at things as if as i said under which dynasty was this working who which king can be said to be practicing it perfectly uh, which era which uh, ad or bc or whatever and uh, you said that uh, well the, the system was such that the king is actually not that important in the sense uh, proper talks of farmers telling their land and they see which 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 500 soldiers just rushing galloping across the field going in a particular direction two hours later another party of marauders come after them and they ask them did you see any soldiers go by and they say yeah they went in that direction so the tiller of the land has practically no interest no say in what happens politically he knows that one person may come other may go and if i have enough grains i give my tax if i don't i go to whichever whichever is the ruler and i say that sir my lord you have to help me this time so that time the king already has taken taxes for the last few years there the grain reserves are there and he releases some of them for the benefit of the famine stricken or maybe that year the monsoons failed whatever yeah mm. so 
although it is next to impossible i could say that because right now even though as uh, practicing gaudiya vaishnavas and we are trying to give this knowledge we still think in terms of when propat was in america nixon was president then johnson and then kennedy was shot and then under clinton this happened then obama this happened so just imagine how difficult it is for someone today to get out of this uh, i would say like a like a, a today's intellectual is shackled by current affairs and news and yeah. unless we in the words of marx whom we quoted few sessions ago uh-huh. that uh, workers of the world unite the only thing you have to lose is your chains so similarly we have to say that transcendentalists of the world unite the only yeah. thing you have to lose is your chronologically affected shackles beautifully <laughs> put that's yeah. true i just reading a book about american culture it is called sustainable decadence sustainable decadence <laughs> <laughs> so what the author says and very well argued case he says that america's future does not will not be as affected by political radicalism no matter how far it goes as it will be affected by how it america deals with the increasing problems of substance abuse and mental health so, substance abuse and mental health so you know, there are there are certain issues which become highlighted in the media as as potentially catastrophic and some of them are but most of them are not so even in today's world Uh, is people's mental health or is people's self destructive ha- are people self destructive habits are they going to change because of who is in power unlikely some people might get frustrated because of certain political changes and may uh, may use get into abusive habits more but basically if we do not tie ourselves too much to the to the media and the media's perception of reality we each human being has a small but significant uh, power of agency to chart their own future and if we go back to the original system which is called as varanashram what so i well, uh, is that okay should i go back to the subject or you want to add something more you said two points Just one last point yeah. last, then we go when we take it back to i also want to go back to our social justice uh, aspect of discussion yes uh, since we talked about uh, this equality at least justice equal and uh, satisfaction equal you were doing different roles different uh, you could be working in different sectors uh, there is a humorous uh, clip from a old charlie chaplin black and white movie where he is unjustly put in prison and uh, so he is not shown miserable there he is shown quite comfortable and in fact he does a heroic deed when some criminals try to break uh free he prevents that ha- from happening and then he is given a good citation he is given a uh, release and then he comes out and the city is full of industrial unrest and strikes and uh, there is all sense of uncertainty he actually goes back and said can i join again can i can i be <laughs> oh god <laughs> can i be allowed once again so mm. apart from the humor which uh, he was a master of slapstick humor but many of his uh, small clips they kind of uh, show a much more uh, a deeper uh, emotional or even you can say a spiritual topic which is still unanswered that why would someone uh, so it's almost like if it's a competition between the advertised uh, sense of freedom and the security of being in a jail and for a common man it is surprising that the so called like in today's times there is freedom to do any job 
but then what is that any job for the west mostly it is working in a walmart or working in a amazon warehouse mm. so therefore this justice system where people are saying that uh, work should give you fulfillment work should give you contentment that nobody seems to touch that topic the government says either we give you some benefit if you are unemployed or we give you some kind of work now if you don't love that work if you don't find fulfillment in life that's not my job and i feel i am not having the answers but i am just asking you that the feeling i have is that this varnashram system uh i prefer the word daivi so that we understand in the right context from past maharaj to this other tapur he said to use the word daivi 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 all the time it means something which is rooted in wisdom and the opposite is asuric where it is exploitationary so for the sake of those who don't want to know the sanskrit or not even the wise uh, caste system and the exploitationary caste system so in kind of the, the whole thing is obvious so i would now like you to uh, explore more your previous point or address this uh, are, are we going towards the direction of the social justice in which we are originally yeah. kind of we yes, definitely that? yeah okay so yeah so social justice basically has the idea that th- there is unfairness in society and sometimes it's uh, horrible and it needs to be resolved so that that ambition that aspiration is noble how is it going to be actualized you no know, do we have across the world even today any country where we can say actually social justice has been implemented so certainly started some some countries were more successful than others but overall to go back to those three quotes i would like to make one one point based on each quote so can i go back to the quotes sure sure so i'll just so here gerald heard used the word organic democracy and he talks about instead of all men being said to be equal which is a lie all That's men strong statement all men are known to be of equal value could we but find the position in which their potential contribution could be released and their essential growth so pursued so now what this means is that the, the now the american declaration of rights began with all people all men are equal so now equality is the aspiration of the human heart and it's a noble aspiration but at the same time it's not a it's not a objective fact in fact whatever material metric we use people will come out unequal whether it is height or weight or complexion or iq or eq or whatever parameter we take for measuring people whether it is drawing ability eloquence whether it is managerial ability even artisan practical skills whatever it is so at a material level equality is not a self evident fact at all in fact what is self evident is is inequality so in any classroom it's not that students are all equally endowed in any cross section of people even twins are not necessarily equally endowed what to speak of a broader cross section of people mm. so so when we say people are equal it is more of a metaphysical longing or a metaphysical hunch by metaphysical i'm not using the word necessarily philosophical but something more in the physical it's not a physically evident fact but it is more of a intuition that we feel yeah people should not be discriminated against people should be treated equally but how exactly is that equality going to come about so the problem is that 
everybody is not equally endowed different people have different talents and rather than claiming artificially that people are equal we focus on trying to help people find uh, how th that everybody can be of equal value if their contribution can be if where they can contribute is discovered so before we go into the whole idea of of discrimin of that oh this was discrimination the fact is that if at all you want to talk about this discrimination nature itself is discriminatory in the sense that some people are born with extremely high iqs uh, some people are some people are brilliant some people are outstanding and some people are outstandingly forgetful if some students say read something once and they just remember it some people read it 50 times and still they can't remember it so we could say at one level by nature there is discrimination and just by a by a declaration in a constitution we cannot change the real of nature reality of nature so would it be possible that somehow there is a social system by which people's people are given a place to contribute equally according to their talents so that every being everyone is valuable everyone is valued in their place and the word organic democracy was used by gerald hurd so the example in the tradition for this is that of a body the body being society being compared to a body maybe would you like to elaborate that example mm. the, 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 the head uh, the head arms belly and legs being compared to the four varanas the okay the, yeah. uh, can you just sort of quote I, i just got two simple points i just finished that and yeah. then i got right. uh, can you just check the quote again on the screen sure yeah so here uh, this jetal heard who is he is he a author thinker yeah, he's an author he's author a thing. western maybe the indologist from the west basically i see you know there is so, in the just a quick context in the history of indology before a uh, political you know, devamrit swami in his book uh, searching for vedic india has a chapter called when the west loved india yeah so so basically he says there was a phase in the history of indian studies before political inter political and economic interests took over or rather uh, the economic interests were were melded with the political desire for power which before that there was like appreciation for in many indian things but afterwards it yeah. was lost that could be a subject in itself okay but but he uh, but there are many many thinkers who have actually appreciated and he is one among them so uh, very strong and i like the statement that all men are being said being said to be equal is a lie correct could we but find the position in which their potential contribution could be released and their essential growth so pursued this strongly uh, points out the direction of somebody guiding society we are telling that release the potential of the masses mm. or make their help them to pursue their essential growth so just like in our body there is a brain and i'll come to the example of the different parts of the body being associated with the different organs so isn't this the task of a pandita a learned person mm -hmm. like you have think tanks you have the entire covid 19 thing guided by one dr alexander fauci uh, dr anthony fauci why well he is a author his book uh, which he authored is a textbook in most immunology classes and so on and so forth so i'm so happy that we have the bhagavad gita where krishna explains vidya vinay sampanne brahmane gavi hasti shuni chaiva shopa kecha there couldn't be any more diverse specimens found in history that here we have vidya vinay sampanna this person is not only profoundly wise he is mm. also humble by training and culture 
And then there is a cow, which is a domesticated animal. There is an elephant, which is not a domesticated animal, but is a sign of wealth. And mostly an animal which is used for a drought animal, for hauling logs and whatever. Mm. Then we have a dog. Now, mind you, in today's context, Westerners, there's a family dog, auditorium. The dog is a man's best friend. Then they have put, hoisted the dog on a much higher pedestal. Mm. But in India, even in common parlance, calling somebody a lucky dog may not be a very good compliment. <laughs> yeah, that's true. The difference of culture. So a dog and then a dog eater. So a dog eater was considered one of the weakest elements of northern society. He may not be even a member of society. He could be living on the fringe, living on the outskirts, not of, the, not of a capital city, but some minor town or, or nearby a village or, a, or bordering a forest or a jungle. I'm just giving a like a gross understanding of these examples have been five models have been taken. But a pandita is said to be samadarshina. He sees all of them equally. How? Is he lying or is he imagining? You can lie and say that I treat all of them equally. Or you can be imagining that all of them equally. But here is supposed to be a pandit. So the only thing common between all of them is the presence of the super soul, the presence of divinity, the form of a friend of the soul, the next door neighbor of the soul. And as you said, unless we bring society to the metaphysical level of seeing things, so we use metaphysics as an internal tool, intellectual tool, but externally we are still rooted in society, we follow the norms, we follow, and what do you mean by following the norms? That uh, you don't treat the Vidya Sampanna Brahman and the dog eater by keeping them at the same level. In a ceremony, they won't be seated next to each other, just for sake of equality. Mm. So, so like uh, there was a management clip which uh, was a favorite of mine that the hero and he's a bumbler he always makes mistakes he he shakes hand with the liftman calling him the CEO and then he says actually I'm not the CEO here I'm, I'm just a liftman and he says oh, I'm so sorry I'm so sorry and then after two minutes the actual CEO comes and he thinks he's a liftman so <laughs> okay so the so the understanding is what could be a bigger error? So considering somebody who is not qualified and giving him a lot of qualifications, that is considered a minor error. But to think somebody who is the boss and call him a janitor, that's a much more bigger level error. Although both of them are employees, both of them are serving in the same corporate office, but the scope of their work and everything is completely different. So similarly, uh, the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna doesn't say that we do away with the elephants and do away with the dogs and do away with the dog eaters. They are there. Mm. There for eternity. Till there is life on earth, there will be this kind of uh, variety. So when someone like George Hurd says that they should be alive, they should be educated, who is the day? That day is somebody who is an adept, pandit, a wise person, especially what Krishna has given the Bhagavad Gita. So to complete that analogy about the four limbs, uh, the Vedas call the social body like a representation of the four Varnas, where arms are the hands. I mean, the Kshatriyas are like the arms. And uh, we also see this thing in English literature where weapons are called arms. Yeah, that's beautiful. Okay. That's true. And so what is the beauty of the arm? The arm is supposed to protect the head. So, yeah. because the head cannot have anything to defend itself. So, when one person tries to try to strike another one on his head, the arms come up. So, similarly, the head office. There are so many branch offices, but one office is called the head office because it thinks like a head. So, that's like the Brahmanas. 
Mm. And the vessels are the protective element. They are the abdomen or the stomach. And what carries the whole society, what carries the physical society outside, is the service sector. And they are the shudras. And in one sense, none of them are considered better than other because I will not favor my left leg or my right leg. I won't say that this is better than the other one. And at the same time, uh, I know that the brain is more important because there could be a fracture of the legs, upset stomach, hand fractured. I can still function. But aneurysm in the brain or brain dead, then even if the other three are very nice, strong, the social body is dead. Yeah, that's true. So there is division of labor, but there is not necessarily discrimination. In fact, I have seen some some people who are critical of the caste system. They take this this very metaphor and they say it's insulting to say that the shudras are the compared to the legs. But that that kind of criticism misses the point that. the legs are also important and if the legs are weakened then the body can't function as easily and normally as it could otherwise so again yeah. now there is we could say there is equality in principle and there is equality in practice uh, maybe a few years ago i remember some of this incident is there in my memory that when the then american president obama had come to uk so he and uh, the british premier premier maybe john major or whoever it was they entered into the house of commons and there was a guard over there so as they were entering obama shook hands with the guard while going in and then the guard was a little surprised he happily shook hands and then the guard looked at the british pm now he was very reluctant to shake hands with the guard <laughs> so <laughs> so this incident was shown as a difference of attitudes maybe the british still have a stuck up attitude whereas say the americans have such a down to earth attitude toward everyone now while what while that might be true still the fact remains that is that that guard is not going to go inside and discuss matters of international security it is exactly. the president is going to go inside so in principle everybody should be respected as a human being hmm? there is some intrinsic worth for everyone in practice everybody has different roles and uh, now the often with respect to the caste system the discrimination is said to be that somebody is constantly relegated to a role, lower role without they uh, they getting an opportunity to to have a higher role so that is that is a valid objection that can i would like to go to the next court to consider that but here the Just first moment, one, moment. Yeah. it is two fold it is like somebody who is qualified and it's a low rank is not allowed to come up and the other uh, the other counterpart is somebody is so called high born and is sticking to his or her post fair or even when clearly shown to be disqualified yes that's a good point so that means now the legs can't do the work which the hands can do or the head can do but if the head is damaged then you cannot just claim that this is the head and this is everybody else has to obey me so there are times when people are injured and they just walk to a certain place it's almost like the body and its body takes over and takes them to safety and they don't remember anything what i did how did i get here so the point is that the whole body has to cooperate so one as an example yeah i saw a small example that uh, would you like to get operated in a hospital where once in a week the ward boys are taking charge of the operation theater just to make it it's a completely physical yeah, example okay it's a physical example and i hope it is not implemented anywhere but just to show that we treat everybody equally that if the ward boys say why don't you give us a chance to perform surgery okay once in a week is your day 
So all of the days, the intellectuals perform their work. And on one particular day, just so that they should not get proud. At the same time, the, the lower sector should not be feeling left out. You also do surgery. They might do, but then how many people will survive after that surgery? My God, that's true. So that means there is a hierarchy based on competence. And there could be a hierarchy based on exploitation. So there is no need to presume intrinsically that any hierarchy that is there will, will necessarily be based on exploitation. So in a, in a surgical setting, there is this main surgeon who is giving orders to everyone. Get this, do this, do this. Now that's because the, the main surgeon is most competent over there. And everybody has their role to play. And uh, everybody plays a valuable role. So first point is that what we discussed at this, the presumption that this is an unjust system is not necessarily true. Because if, even if at least in principle, we understand that if people, different people have different abilities and if they're engaged accordingly, then they all can contribute equally. And they're not equal, but they can contribute equally. So now in today's world, where we say that everyone is equal, but there's a major problem that comes because of that. I'd like to explore the other, another quote for this purpose. Yes, please go ahead. This is Mark Tully. The alienation of many young people in the West and the loneliness of the old show the suffering that egalitarian inflicts on those who do not win. The superficiality of an egalitarianism, which in effect means equal opportunities for all to win and then ignores the inevitable losers. So if it is glamorized, everybody can be an entrepreneur. Everybody can maybe become the CEO of a big startup in future. And as it is said, the meritocracy brings about the belief that you, know, you could be the next uh, Bill Gates by the age of 33. But then you realize that you are just at the at the middle of the middle rungs of a corporate structure and you are going past 40 and that leads to so much depression. So rather than having this presumption that everybody has equal opportunity and then there'll be losers because not everybody is equally endowed. But the only institution which does provide a sense of identity and dignity, those who are robbed from birth of the opportunity to compete on an equal footing. This is a profound point that birth itself discriminates. Now, now you can say society may discriminate the people based on birth, but apart from that, birth itself discriminates in the sense that some people are born with a high IQ, some with a low IQ. So in today's educational system, we could say that birth itself has discriminated against students who say don't have a very good memory, don't have a very good analytic, um, especially uh, um, math skills or whatever. So somebody, if everybody is told you, have, you have, your success in life is to become an engineer or a doctor, and then everything else is seen like a consolation prize. You couldn't do that. But instead, if there was a social structure where everybody were given a trajectory and you're given support for pursuing the trajectory right from childhood. So it's if somebody dreams to be an engineer and then they have to settle to be a clerk or something like that. But instead, you know, if you are born in a particular family, then that person has a career ahead of them. Somebody is born in a farm, family of potters, or of farmers, or in royalty, or in saying teachers and intellectuals, then the whole anxiety of trying to find out one's career and quite often struggling and going through insecurity and then eventually experiencing frustration, that whole anxiety could be avoided. This is not necessarily a perfect system or it not necessarily always been perfectly implemented, but in principle, if you understand that this had its strength, that uh, it sometimes said that too many options 
don't actually bring freedom they only bring anxiety yes so and that is what is happening egalitarianism says everybody is equal you can choose any profession that you want well people might just get so crippled by anxiety and uncertainty that they just don't move forward so a certain amount of uh, of predictability and structure to one's life is not necessarily a bad thing in fact it could actually give a lot of st- mental stability for people to pursue their life journey any thoughts on this yeah uh, just one small thought that uh, the preoccupation with um, understanding hierarchy and putting the whole blame on hierarchy saying that the hierarchy in india's uh, society is the single most important cause of all of india's was economic was social was whatever so doing away with hierarchy i see a lot more common with the marxist way of looking at they look at politics like that that please don't try to see the situation and try to rectify it destroy it from the foundation yeah that and it was not just a kind of a fixation it was a obsession with violence and especially the violent overthrow of everything and uh, they they realized to their peril that along with a few superficial negatives or whatever they also uh, the society lost kind of the the will to live that uh, marxism was trying to save Uh, workers from becoming robots and uh, by the way uh, the russian word for work is uh, rabat rabat so one who works is a rabat and what does that mean rabat so the english like a- language took the same word as a mechanical industrial worker a soulless okay. kind of a worker and then it became literally used for uh robots that means so what oh okay just a mechanical thing which works but otherwise the it is a original almost all slavic languages russian check have this word robot means to work so any thoughts on this that uh, mm, this is seen in even in today's indian intellectuals that uh, very angry at the mere mention of the word hierarchy yeah at first destroy hierarchy and you know then what they discover that without hierarchy you don't have a system that's true so the the rejection of hierarchy does not create equality it creates anarchy and now there is to some extent say an incredible amount of ingratitude a toward the existing structure that's a typical characteristic of leftist thought the whatever we what every system throughout history has had its problems and you, we cannot have anything problem free but there are many things that are working and to reject something because of its flaws do we have a working model of something else that works so now again the point over here is that yes caste system have there was a hierarchy and within that hierarchy uh, there were there were blemishes but does that mean necessarily that uh, that the caste the principle of hierarchy itself is bad that presumption it's like uh, as they say throw the baby out with the bath water so just yeah. yes we want to, like i think prabhupad would give the example that remove the cataract in the eye don't just pluck out the eye so eye is what able enables us to see and basically when the eye sees what does it do it it places things in a hierarchy this is more important this is what i have to pay attention to that is not that important i don't have to pay that much attention to that when we are dry, suppose somebody is driving a car the eye focus is okay those who are on the road and are about to come on my path i have to focus on them more 
and what are the kind of buildings in the what kind of area i am passing through okay that i can notice but that's not the foremost importance so i think for doing any in something as simple as say driving a vehicle we need to place our observations in a hierarchy of importance so like that and somebody who can't place things in a hierarchy that that person cannot function properly in fact i read one psychological definition of insanity insanity so insanity means to is the failure to place things in their proper hierarchy that means somebody hears something which has happened far away and they oh this may happen to me and they become paralyzed they hear of somebody got a heart attack somebody they what if i get a heart attack and they can't function after that so everything that we do requires some level of hierarchical arrangement of our perceptions and what applies at the individual level also applies at the social level that what that we have to have some kind of hierarchy for society to function and ironically those communists who or those uh, leftists who say that hierarchies are bad and they have to be destroyed eventually they end up demanding the creation of even more rigid hierarchies where they are at the top so for example nowadays political correctness is such that anybody who makes one politically incorrect statement they are treated like a pariah they are treated like a untouchable and who decide what is politically correct it is those who those who are leftists they decide that so as i think george orwell said famously that all people are equal communism but some people are more equal than others so any thoughts on you can this? see that you can see that in the lifestyle of almost all the communist rulers of eastern europe soviet union included most of them had a city residence and then a hunting lodge and uh, right from tito to romania's ceausescu this romanian person ceausescu he embarked on a 1500 or so room palace called the people's palace and it was his own personal residence by the way that's such a stinking level of hypocrisy <laughs> exactly so so therefore uh, even in russia i mean in soviet union for the common masses would be the government managed department stores and there would be the gum g u m gum stores which were only for the party elite oh so i think this is a important point which you move forward that hierarchies are re are required and in principle these hierarchies did serve a purpose so now the third quote i'll just quickly go to that yeah it it adds one more point to it that okay so this is the i point i started with so now how did the caste system provide stability at a social level so it makes him i'm going to the middle of the quote here it makes him at the outside a member of a corporate body it protects him through a life through life from the canker of social jealousy and unfulfilled aspirations it ensures him companionship and a sense of community with others in like case with himself the caste organization is to the hindu his club his trade union his benefit society his philanthropic society now what this quote emphasizes is that caste rather than creating division it also created connections when we say that everybody is equal uh what happens is people just get atomized and lost in the vastness of the of the cities and the concrete jungles and the corporate giants people just feel like insignificant cog in the wheel but if there is a village there is a town there is a city in which say there are people who are of a similar profession and they all are together as a group then there is a sense of community that comes over there 
and that sense of community becomes as i said their, their insurance so yes there is division of society but the division also creates a sense of cohesion and if there is no division there is no cohesion so one one aspect of leftist thought is the rejection of uh, national boundaries they say why should we have all of humanity is one but now the current covid crisis has shown how important national boundaries are because you can have to galvanize resources it has to be done at the, you cannot be do it at the amorphous international level it has to be done at the national level so similarly within society when there are divisions that also brings cohesion within each which each identify distinct unit so people from each caste would come together and they would have a sense of belonging they would have a sense of uh, a place within overall society and then they would speak from and they would have their representatives would speak during the coronation of ram or rather when uh, dashrath wanted to pass over the power to ram at that time he called uh, uh assembly to consult and inform and it is said that along with the courtiers there were representatives from all the four varanas and all of them had a voice over there mm. and they all said that yes this is bravo this is excellent decision ram is eminently qualified to do this so they were all seated in their own places their own areas and the idea was that uh, this brought a sense of cohesion which is often quite often uh, overlooked in the uh, emphasis on uh, the discrimination the division that happened because of it any thoughts on this uh yeah i primarily am kind of very much attached to this concept from the first canto of shrimad bhagavatam where the boy shringi the brahmana boy he curses a kshatriya king and shri prabhupad makes a point in that purport that there are divisions there are hierarchies but what exactly is the hallmark of the age of kali is the animosity between the varnas beautiful yes so this animosity this particular incident kind of sowed the seeds of animosity so whenever i see somebody superior i can have two or three kind of uh, emotions coming in my mind oh this person is endowed oh i don't have what he this person has thirdly can i make a try if i can do something better in these two three fields can i join him what exactly do i need to do who should i take guidance from in order to reach that level now these i can say this correct me if i'm wrong these are like normal sentiments but when i see someone and i only get the thought of wrecking his mercedes vehicle or shooting him or assuming that because he is high he necessarily has to be evil and because i am low that is proof enough that i am good hmm and therefore i need to take the law in my own hands and so what justice means is justice doesn't mean i work in some way to pacify myself or if possible try to achieve what this person has but justice simply means i remove all the paraphernalia which surround this person's achievement and ruin him or destroy the uh, symbols of power as they say and this is exactly what marxists uh, systematically did most countries they had some previous artifacts some books or something for example in cambodia just because it is a low income country and doesn't matter much in today's history terms the the regime was called the khmer rouge the red khmers and pol pot was the assumed name of their leader and he said from today it is year 0 that means all that of 
uh, what has happened in our past is of no relevance. Year zero, and then year one, then year two, and we will. And surprisingly, I mean, after one and a half or two million people killed, it was the worst political genocide of the 70s and 80s. He said that uh, because inherently we are a superior race. So can you imagine that uh, they don't have anything to show the world, no technological, no economic or political thought or anything. And they were thinking as if they are the superior race. And that's why they need to start everything from ground zero. And basically what exactly you described, destroy all hierarchies. And uh, anybody who could count up to say 500 or 1000 or who was a poet or a journalist, anybody who could think was seen as a first fallen enemy of the state, they should all be eliminated. Mm. So although we fear Hitler's way of thinking himself superior and killing Jews and other races, or almost everybody takes turns today thinking they are superior. <laughs> everybody is of the same age. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Kaluga seems to be a merry-go-round of uh, now what is that uh, musical chairs kind of a thing where there are seven chairs and eight people. So obviously when the music stops, one is to be eliminated. And they are all of the same ilk, but those who remain, they feel they are superior. Yes, <laughs> that's true. Mm -hmm. So now going back to that point about equality and otherwise, if we have a pendulum. Just a small point. Yeah. Could you, could you please shed some light on what Sidney Lowe says, the last four things, which is very, I like that quote. I just am feeling how it can be translated into society today, like the caste becomes this person's club, his, uh, his trade union you mentioned. Yeah. yeah. Have you pondered on that? Yeah. Club, trade union, benefit society and philanthropic society. How is it? Uh, how is it possible? Yeah. My understanding of that is that people from each caste feel the responsibility of taking care of others of their caste. So when it creates a cohesion, then it helps them get a sense of community with others. And uh, so Kshatriya, so while at one level, the, the government might, you might go to the king for getting some charity. But the other understanding is also that there is, uh, the, this person belongs to our group. So let's take care of him. So in that sense, his idea is that it's, it's the club, it's the, it's the philanthropic society. So rather than simply going out to someone who is of a, who is a money lender or who is a, who somebody from whom you have to ask for charity. Now, of course, depending on how wealthy or poor one is, one might not be able to give financial charity, but it's just like, uh, I have heard and read about this that say, if there is a, the house of a say British Lord or someone and says one worker gets injured over there, then everybody else pitches in to do the work of that worker and they take care of that worker. Why? Because they understand that we are all one unit and today I take care of that person and tomorrow they will take care of me. So, so all these people who are working, they have a sense of cohesion. And uh, that is important. So now you might, we might focus on the fact that, oh, none of these workers can ever become the Lord. Well, that is true. That may be true in that, in that particular context, but you know, there being the workers together as a unit, uh, there, are, there are cases, you know, for example, there were say British Lords who you know, had the same butler, the butler's son would become the next butler, then in the next mm. world of generations. So there was a certain amount of uh, stability in that. You could use this. You could use this word stability or stasis. Stasis has a negative connotation. Stability has a positive connotation. So the idea of upward mobility, which is so prominent in today's world, this was not there so much in the past. And we could call that as a deficiency. But this fantasy that anybody can rise to any height in society 
a few people do that but it also sends it also keeps the remaining in a, a constant state of dissatisfaction yes so now if i was thinking of a pen, can i move ahead to the next point now yeah you finished the three quotes no i think so yeah the quote quote I, I, you want to add something on that quote no. how you thought it would it might be a it might be a, like a club or a philanthropic society any thoughts no, no, on no. That? similar similar thoughts what you had okay so now if we consider pendulum there is the cap capitalism communism and then we have the we have the caste system now i would like to use the word varanashram but we'll come to that a little later let's keep it caste system at this stage despite the negative connotation so capitalism says that in presumption everybody is equal or but if if it's a meritocratic society but the idea is let the market determine everyone's position yeah okay. let the market be the sole determiner of everyone's position and communism says basically let the state determine everyone's position the state will decide you will be doing this job you will be doing this job whereas the caste system says well nature has already determined your position you just act according to it so that nature has created particular kind of dispositions with the with a particular set of abilities and inabilities and if we can find a position that is harmonious with that that will be good so the real problem within varanashram comes up when there are misfits like you said the misfits can be of two kinds somebody is placed in a lower position and now here we are lower it is not using lower in a judgmental sense but in a functional mm -hmm. sense so somebody is placed in a lower position when they can work for at a higher position and somebody it sticks to a higher position even when they they are not cap capable of functioning at that higher position so now how would we the real challenge with any kind of system like this would be how to ensure that people are in that position in the in the mahabharat there is a discussion between nahusha and yudhishthir and uh, nahusha asks yudhishthir nahusha is a king who has uh, now become who has been cursed who has become a snake and now he is he is at the snake's body he is going to be released if his questions are answered so he asks yudhishthir questions so at that time he asks what is the determiner of caste and then yudhishthir gives a elaborate answer and then he says that ultimately it is it is one's qualities it is one's more, more qualities as is manifested through one's behavior so he says traditionally birth itself was a fair determiner of one's qualities because in today's world birth is seen to be simply a genetic accident that a man and a woman chose to unite and then based on the way they united uh based on, then their genes came together and gave a progeny your rise to a progeny but within the vedic world view is understanding the soul who reincarnates and based on the disposition of the uniting couple a soul of a similar disposition is attracted to uh, into their their womb as their child so a uh, brahmana and a brahmani those who are intellectuals they would attract the soul of intellectual disposition a somebody somebody who is a merchant they would attract the soul of a merchant disposition so therefore it would be that people would be by birth geared toward the kind of uh, kind of social vocation that they were made, they were best suited for in future and it's not just birth it also they would get the upbringing so then that upbringing also provides a head start it like somebody is born in a born in a family of doctors and then they want they are innately inclined to be artists then throughout their maybe the childhood and youth they have the training of being a doctor and then they have to become artists how do i do that so actually if we understand or at least theoretically accept the idea that there are multiple that 
there is an evolving soul and a soul's position in this uh, life is not merely an accident then a system where a soul is born in a particular family and the soul is trained for a particular vocation may well give that soul a head start rather than being a discrimination at all yeah any thoughts on this further no so let us summarize we were yeah hour. yeah so i think the real problem problem came up when there's a entitlement mentality and that's what got lost so do you think we will need another session to discuss how varanashram could be applied in today's world and we talk about vedik varanashram and uh, uh, daivi and asuri yeah so then then we can focus more on only the solutions part yes so we have discussed the uh, the symptoms of the disease we try to find out the cause of the disease but uh, we also need to discuss little bit of the remedy for it yes so i think we'll continue that in the next session then so i'll summarize we okay. basically basically discussed yeah about through the caste system and while the caste system has been villainized it had its it had its utility it had its strength so one of the main if you want to know its strength it is the very fact that indian society has been so resilient despite uh, millennia of aggressions and uh, uh, sacking still it was it was resilient and that was because the caste system provided a place for people to function in <clears throat> so while there has been discrimination the extent of the discrimination is often exaggerated discrimination and exploitation are inherently inherent possibilities in any human system of hierarchy and in other places like north america and south america it was much worse it was not just discrimination it was almost extermination so in india not only there is a resilience is there people continue to survive and expand so we discussed three main virtues of the uh, of the caste of social division according to caste one is it rejects the presumption that everybody is equal but focuses yeah. on helping people make an equitable contribution by finding their position so the idea that everybody is equal simply uh, creates a lot of tension because equality is not a self evident physical fact it is more of a metaphysical longing whose translation into reality requires a lot of thought and planning hierarchies based on competence are not only uh, required but they are indispensable uh, not only not bad but they are indispensable for functioning in society and the second point of how it was equal or how the caste system was beneficial was that it helped people give them a sense of identity and value even if birth had discriminated against them so it it is they if you consider uh, education system in which iq is the same high iq is essential for success then birth itself discriminates against many students so rather than having one definition of success for all all people you know, have a social structure where there are different definitions of success for different people and train everyone accordingly so and the third part was that while the, there has been while the focus has always been on discrimination with, because of the caste system has also been a sense of cohesion within each caste where people from one caste people from within one caste come to help each other because they know we all belong to the same social group and rather than let the market determine the fate of people or, or let the state determine the fate of people acknowledge that nature has already determined uh, the starting point of everyone and then give them the best launching pad accordingly the caste system became becomes problematic when those who are in lower position are not allowed to rise up or those who are high up who are in a higher position without the qualification stick on over there so the caste system often maybe solve the problem of uh, individual and social engagement in a way that proved to be resilient for very long and how it went wrong and what was to be done about it we'll discuss in a future session did i leave anything out 
No, no. Thank you. Thank you.